2020 had to be one of the best years for video games in a while, and it was very fitting for there to be a broad variety of games to play this year, considering the situation we're in. Two games in particular this year allowed us to connect with our friends and family inside of digital islands and spaceships, and even ignoring that fact were great games in general. But here's an overview of the games I played this year. Of course, this game came out in 2019, but I didn't play it because it didn't really catch my attention. I'd rather just stick to Sonic Riders. But when the Sonic movie came out this year, the game was on sale for 20 or 15 bucks on the Nintendo eShop. So I figured, eh, with that price, I've got nothing to lose. I gotta say, the game was better than I expected. I loved the vehicle customization options and all of the tracks are great, and some of these are pretty unexpected callbacks. I wouldn't have expected Holoska from Sonic Unleashed to be in this game, but here it is accompanied by an amazing remix from Hyper Potions. Speaking of which, this game also had a pretty great soundtrack to it as well. Of course, I still like Sonic Riders more, but this game is still pretty good too. But the two games still have the same problem, where... There's not much content once you've played all the tracks and played as all of the different characters. If you're not too sure about this game like I was, I'd wait for a sale or something even though the game is already 40 US dollars. This was one of the biggest games of the year. Animal Crossing's relaxing and slow-paced gameplay, along with the fact that you could play online with other people, made it the perfect game to play during this horrible time. I've never played Animal Crossing before this, but its simple gameplay makes it fun for all ages. One thing about this game that I've absolutely loved seeing is all of the stuff that people have created. It's so cool to watch island tours on YouTube and check out pretty screenshots on Twitter and Reddit. I also love watching villager hunts. It's also just a nice community in general. I suggest checking out Tagback TV and Chase Crossing for the best island tours and villager hunts out there. This game really lets you get creative with your design with its terraforming and waterscaping and of course, part of what makes Animal Crossing what it is are the villagers. There's basically 400 of these guys, which is crazy. The only other games with that many characters are Pokemon and Skylanders. But of course, unlike those games, you don't play as the villagers or command them. They basically just live on your island as your neighbors and you could have nice interactions with them, which is kind of my problem with other build your own world games. If you don't have anyone to play with, it's pretty lonely and there's really nothing else to do once you build your place up. But of course, I can't talk about this game without mentioning the obvious elephant or in this case, Raccoon in the Room, Tom Nook. This guy puts you in debt. It seriously took me six months, which is half of a whole year, to pay off all of his loans, including the storage upgrade that came out in a recent update. But I still like this aspect of the game, as it gives you an additional goal to work towards. This is definitely my favorite game of the year. Sorry, Miles. Okay guys, I have the most awesome plan. I'm gonna crash head first into the cafeteria window. What do you mean? Like, you're gonna jump out and smash it with your head? No, no, with my helicopter. What do you guys think? I'm ready to- Hold on, I don't really understand. What's not to understand? It's simple. I fly the helicopter into the window. But, how does that help? <sighs> I don't really think you get it. Henry, you get it, right? I, I guess I'm outvoted then. Um, I think it's a little bit- out of range now. Henry Stickman was an amazing series of Flash games made by the one and only Puffballs United, and this collection is a great remaster of those old versions. However, this collection isn't entirely old content. 
It also comes with a brand new entry that acts as the ultimate finale to the series, completing the mission. This was such a worthy finale to Puff's 13 year project and really goes to show that any piece of media really needs a proper conclusion to bring it around. That was one of my gripes with fleeing the complex. It was a great game, but it didn't deliver the finale like we would have wanted it to. And now that we have completing the mission, no wonder why. This new game has a total of 164 fails and 16 different endings, making it larger than all of the previous games combined. With how large this game is and still retaining the charm and comedy of the originals, as well as how it's a very worthy conclusion, this is definitely my favorite in the series. The parts of this game that I really like are the endings that involve Ellie since she's my favorite character, and also some of the fails that make fun of video game tropes such as clipping through the floor, the dance off scenes were a pretty funny running gag, and the fight scenes with the cybernetic right hand man in their revenge ending were really cool. This game also has my favorite fail in the entire series, walkthrough. This was such a funny way to make fun of boring YouTube videos with tons of self-promotion and Puff really went the extra mile with this fail by using his old Xbox 360 headset to record the audio. And the thing that I love about this fail is that it doesn't end until you click and then it'll tell you how long you watched that scene for. Also, I gotta talk about the raccoon in the room for this game as well, the Valiant Hero ending. The first time I saw this ending, it was both funny and sad at the same time, which are two very conflicting emotions. I know some people don't like this ending because of how Charles dies, which yeah, kinda sucks, but I mean, it was done well in my opinion. The only ending I'm not the biggest fan of is Top At Civil Warfare. It's a fine enough ending I guess, but I just hate that Ellie has to be your enemy in this path, and it's also very short. Although this ending still has its moments, I like the chainsaw fail, and also that Dave Panpa gets time to shine. I'm glad that the series got the finale it deserved, and I'm looking forward to seeing what Puff has next for us in the future. These powers are a part of us. And all I do know, it's a lot better if you just embrace that. Thankfully, my worst fears for this game back when the rumors first surfaced of it being a live service game weren't a reality. But I still feel like this game could have been better than what we got. Let me just say that a lot of people compare this game to Destiny and I'll be honest here, I had no idea people actually liked that game. I mean, I'm not judging, I'm just saying, that's news to me. Personally, yeah, I guess the loot system is similar to Destiny, but if anything, the gameplay feels more like Dynasty Warriors as opposed to Destiny. It's kind of the same trope of, hey look, there's a ton of enemies in this area, obliterate them all! I do want to at least highlight that the single player campaign is definitely where this game shines the most as well as the Kate Bishop DLC that came out in December. And speaking of which, that's definitely an approach to this game that I've always liked and I've been giving a good rep ever since our real showcase in E3 2019. All of the added content to this game is entirely free and there's no loot boxes or microtransactions shoved down your throat. It's always nice that there's something to look forward to in this game. I'm personally excited about Spider-Man, but that's also a problem in a way. Not really the updates themselves, but the base content. This game really lacks in game modes and environments right now. Perhaps more of that stuff will be added in later, but it just really makes you feel the repetition of going to a deserted area all the time, doing the same thing over and over again. They already have stealth in the game from the story mode, so why not add stealth missions? In fact, didn't they say at one point that there would be stealth in the game? Well, clearly, 
That never really happened other than that one mission. Other suggestions I really like are investigation missions, big four to six player horde missions, similar to the Battle of Wakanda and Infinity War, or even defend the base missions. Sure, fighting robots as the Avengers is fun, but it's only fun for so long before it starts getting repetitious. The variety of characters to choose from does keep things fresh for a little while, so if you get bored of playing as Iron Man, switch it up and start using Cap for a bit, but eventually, with the lack of variety, it's still eventually going to get stale, and you'll want to take a break. I do hope that in the future this game gets remedied of that issue, and I could play basically every single day for a year straight, like I did with Animal Crossing, and how I did when the game first came out, but like I said, at least it wasn't a disaster. One other gripe with this game that I have is the gear. Not necessarily the gear itself, but more so how unlocking new gear works. If you want to get your heroes all the way to power level 150, you have to get exotic gear. Okay, simple enough, I could just stick with what I'm comfortable with until I unlock that stuff, right? Nope, in order to get there, you have to keep replacing your gear with higher level gear until you eventually get legendary and exotic gear. That was a major road bump when I was playing this game because I didn't know that that, that was how it actually worked until December. So I sadly had to say goodbye to the gear I've been using since October in order to unlock hives and rips. The unlocking system really shouldn't work like that, and should be based off of how much I've gathered over the time I've played. If you are planning on getting this game at some point, I do recommend it for the story and the updates that bring additional heroes, but just don't expect anything too mind-blowing like Spider-Man PS4. Of course, this game came out back in 2018, but I didn't end up playing it until recently since the game released at a bad time for me, since Splatoon 2 was still getting updates and Splatfests at the time, and I was still in high school, and I also had big things on the plate for my channel. I just wouldn't have had enough time to play the game if I got it, but now I was finally able to get it, and I can't really say much about it other than it's fun and the new additions are pretty cool, however there's one thing I'd like to mention, Brawl is the only other Smash game I've played, and that game was pretty floaty, and I thought that since Ultimate isn't, that it would be weird and off-putting, but if anything, it just immediately felt all the more natural. The reason why Brawl was floaty is that it was supposed to appeal to newcomers, but since that feels awkward, it just ends up eliminating the whole point of that. What? Look, we have to work together to complete tasks on this spaceship before the imposter sabotages and takes out the other players. We gotta figure out who it is before it's too late. Ironically, this is another game that came out in 2018, however, most of us actually haven't played this game until now. It kind of exploded out of nowhere. Among Us is an online social deduction game similar to the party game Mafia, sometimes referred to as werewolves, where you are given a role and the players have to work together to figure out who's who. In this game, you're either a crewmate or an imposter, the crew have to walk around the maps doing your tasks and work together to figure out who the imposters are. Meanwhile, imposters have to blend in with the crew and slowly kill their team hoping not to be discovered. The crew will win by either successfully voting out the imposters or by completing every single one of their tasks and the imposters will win if they manage to kill a certain amount of the crew members or if the crew fails to fix something they sabotaged. Being an imposter is definitely the most fun part of the game despite how stressful it can be sometimes. However, I still enjoy being a crewmate as well. If I had to describe this game in one phrase, it would be simplistic gameplay with complex payoffs. Even though there's only three maps in this game right now with a fourth coming pretty soon, 
I'm still able to play this game consistently due to how fun it is. It's definitely best played with a group of friends, however, if you're like me and your friends don't play this game, you could always resort to Discord servers or public lobbies, but I'll tell you those have mixed results. Sometimes public lobbies are fun, but sometimes there's cheaters or hackers that will ruin the experience, or sometimes people are trolls or idiots, no offense, but most of the time when I play in public lobbies, it's actually not that bad. Seriously though, if you haven't played this game, you really should give it a shot, especially with how cheap it is. It's free on mobile devices, and it's only $5 on PC and Nintendo Switch, and the game will be coming to Xbox Game Pass whenever the next update comes out, so hopefully that also means a PS4 version will come in due time. I promise to do everything in my power to protect this city. I promise. That's it? That oath a real thing. Totally. Definitely didn't just make it up. Here we are, big ol' number seven. Often said to be the luckiest number of them all, and also the amount of Chaos Emeralds there are in the Sonic series, so win-win. Miles Morales is without a doubt a worthy successor to the original 2018 masterpiece. It's kind of a shame that this game had to be a filler side salad game to fill the void between Spider-Man 1 and 2, because this game's biggest downfall is the fact that it had to be a shorter experience. It would have been better if it was longer, however, it's still a great addition to the series, and I'm happy that we had something to fill the void. Miles' Venom powers and invisibility are really fun tools, however, Miles has significantly less gadgets than Peter did in the first one, and I do miss some of those gadgets, but I guess Miles would be extremely OP if he had the web bombs combined with his Venom powers. But they could have at least given him the impact web, that wouldn't have been that overpowered. Especially if the ammo on it was extremely limited. I also gotta say that I love the way that Miles swings in this game. Since he's still getting used to being Spider-Man, his body moves around frantically, showing that he doesn't have a lot of control over himself, and the air tricks especially give Miles style. Seriously, Peter, not to dunk on you or anything, but your air tricks are pretty lackluster compared to the one Miles does, and you better step it up in Spider-Man 2. Hey, wait a minute. Peter doesn't even have the same face anymore! Oh my god, this guy didn't even try to hide himself! He's an imposter! Vote him out! So... Now there's two questions here. A, what did he do with John Bobniak? And B, how is there another imposter? So now my rating of all these games from best to worst would be number one, Animal Crossing New Horizons. Very fun game that was perfect for the current situation, and I think the game got robbed of Game of the Year. I mean, seriously, Last of Us 2 won despite how many people hated it, whereas Animal Crossing kept so many people entertained for so long, and if it never came out, they wouldn't have known what to do with themselves. Come on, how did that happen? Either Game Awards is rigged, or our votes don't even matter. Number 2, Spider-Man Miles Morales. The only reason I put this game at number 2 as opposed to number 1 is just because of how it's not a full-blown sequel to the first game. Number 3, Among Us. It's just a lot of fun. Number 4, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Same thing. Number 5, The Henry Stigman Collection. Call me biased but I was conflicted on whether to put this at number 5 or number 6, but with how funny the games are as well as the amount of work and dedication that had to go into it, I decided to put it at number 5. Number 6, Marvel's Avengers. I'm glad that this game wasn't a train wreck, but it still could have been better. Number 7, Team Sonic Racing. 
While TSR surpassed my pretty low expectations, its lack of content and poor online servers really bring the game down from being the best version of itself. But I mean, it's a racing game anyway, so did you expect it to be so high on the list? So those are all of the games I played in 2020 and how I ranked them. Of course, there were other games that came out this year. I do want to give a bit of a mention to one other game, which is Fall Guys Ultimate Knockout. I didn't buy this game, but I played about two hours of it when I was at my sister's house right after I finished Marvel's Avengers, and I watched Tagback TV streams of it. I feel like this game has a similar case to Marvel's Avengers and Team Sonic Racing where it's fun, but the repetition slash lack of content makes it get boring pretty quickly. And in my opinion, it's actually more fun to watch Tag play it. It's kind of a shame that there aren't really going to be any games coming out this year that I'll be interested in, unless there's a surprise hit like Among Us, or if a 30th anniversary Sonic game ends up coming out this year. However, I still have a pretty decent backlog of games to get through, so at least I have that for this year. With all that said, thanks for watching the video, and I wish you all the best.